Good morning, scholars. Uh, this is going to be my lecture, my video lecture for chapter 16. So if you've made it this far, congratulations. Uh, you uh, have uh, successfully or will have successfully completed the course very shortly. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about social movements. We've talked about all these different social problems and social issues, uh, but we haven't really given very many solutions. I mean, uh, we, we've briefly discussed uh, some things that we think might make uh, things better, uh, you know, in terms of uh, adjusting to new definitions of family and things of that nature. But today we're going to talk a little bit about how we can try to bring about social change in society because the whole purpose behind uh, studying social problems and social issues and studying society is to try to make the world a better place and so uh, in this chapter we're going to talk about some things that are important to social movements who want to bring about change for example if you're a part of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement or if you are a part of the uh, feminist uh, movement the w women's movement uh, these are some things that uh, need to be considered or, or the LGBT community. Uh, if you want to bring about change in any of those uh, arenas in American life, um, social movements are a way to try to bring that about. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that as we uh, wrap up the semester because um, like I said, we've talked about a lot of social issues and social problems, but we really haven't uh, presented too many uh, options for solutions at this point. So this chapter is devoted entirely to trying to uh, manage the change that occurs in our society because change uh, is inevitable, right? Um, and, and in fact, uh, over the course of my lifetime, I've seen the speed with which change occurs uh, spiral almost out of control. So uh, we're going to talk about how we can bring about social change that we think is is uh, beneficial to society. So your text defines social change as a significant alteration over time in behavior patterns and culture. And uh, you know we can debate what really involves significant uh, alteration and all of those kinds of things but uh, if we are going to live the American dream as a country, uh, that means that all groups uh, need greater access to resources and greater opportunities. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, historically our country has been one of unequal opportunities. And, and I'm not sure that we can uh, totally eliminate that, but we can certainly uh, make a stab at getting uh, a greater level of equality in our society and I think that certainly uh, is my goal uh, that's why I teach these classes because I want you guys to understand the process of social change and uh, how we can go about trying to, to produce a more just equitable society so there are some questions about you know how does change occur uh, it's almost never a situation where the dominant group says Oh gosh, look, here's some inequality. Let's eradicate that. Let's make this better. Uh, change generally occurs because, um, you know, society sees that it's time to bring about some changes due to an increase in young people who are concerned about a particular issue. So, for example, if young people become very environmentally conscious, uh, they can uh, exert uh, pressure on uh, the, the government and uh, various entities out there that are uh, tasked with the uh, responsibility of protecting the environment. Um, but they can also do things on their own. They can uh, gather together and go and co collect uh, trash and uh, pile it up and uh, haul it to landfills uh, and try to, uh, you know, improve uh, the immediate environment that they're in. So we're going to talk about some of these things. Uh, and the question, you know, the text asks, asks the question, is uh, this process of change predictable or is it unpredictable? Can we have some kind of control over it? Can we make some generalizations? Uh, and so we'll talk about that. And also they ask the question of globalization and how that uh, contributes to social change. Uh, I would say that globalization has had a dramatic impact on uh, social change because now we are in uh, immediate and constant contact with people all around the world 
And if something happens in uh, China, it can have a dramatic impact on our lives here in the United States. So, for example, if there's an earthquake that destroys a, a, a personal computer a chip facility, production facility, uh, then that can have an impact on us here in the United States because we buy lots of computers with those chips. And so uh, the prices of the computers may go up substantially. Uh, there could be a shortage of new chips for a while and that can delay technology. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, uh, researchers in Italy develop a new uh, diagnostic tool that can be used uh, to uh, scan people's bodies to find tumors or whatever, uh, then that, uh, that now is being shared uh, all around the world and now that technology could be used in other countries uh, to attack this uh, very serious disease. So, uh, you know, globalization and our ability to communicate with each other uh, has certainly brought us closer together in some ways, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, in terms of, of uh, uh, foreign relations, uh, governments are still uh, squabbling and fighting and spying on each other and doing all kinds of things uh, of that nature. So your text gives some examples of social change that has affected American life. And then you give the example of the decline in drive-in movie theaters. Uh, we see that back in 1954, there were about 3,600 or so uh, drive-in theaters. And that actually went up to almost 4,000 in 1958. But since about uh, 1977, we've started seeing a fairly significant decline in the number of drive-in movies. And in 2015, uh, there are less than 500, uh, actually it looks like maybe around 200 around the country. Um, and so that's a pretty significant change. And we can uh, look at all the variables that might have contributed to that, the rise of, of the VHS and DVDs. Uh, later on. Uh, and so the ready availability of movies that people can watch at home without having to get in their car and drive to the drive-in movie. Of course, we're missing out on some things. You know, if you've never been to a drive-in movie, uh, I think you're missing out on an experience. And there is a, uh, a drive-in theater uh, somewhere, I think, uh, between Dallas and Waco. Um, so, you know, if you get a chance, uh, you might drive down, I think, 35, I-35 and uh, go to the outdoor movie theater. It's probably a lot safer than going to an indoor movie theater right now. Uh, so, you know, uh, you might uh, see if those are open and, and check them out. Uh, but that's been a significant change. The first movie that I went to see was a drive-in movie that my parents took me to. There was actually a twin feature and one of them was a, an old Burt Reynolds moonshine movie. Uh, movie and then the other one was uh, was another moonshine movie. I don't know why there was a, moon, a double feature of moonshine movies that night, but uh, I was a very, very small child, probably four, four years old or so, and uh, got to go to the theater, the, the outdoor uh, theater with my parents uh, and watch the movie. And back then you had to hang the old speaker on your window. Uh, they didn't use the radio frequency and broadcast the signal. It was actually a, a, a speaker that you hung on the window of your car so that you could hear the dialogue of the movie. Uh, very unique experience. You know, it's, uh, it's really a, a, a kind of a nostalgic thing for me to think about uh, going to the drive-in movie. So, um, you know, another example they use is uh, the number of people who walk to work. Uh, when communities were fairly small uh, and kind of centered around the central business district, a lot of people tended to walk to work. Um, not only was that a cheap way to get to work and people lived close to their jobs in a lot of cases, uh, but it also, you know, increased their uh, activity and therefore was a healthier uh, uh, way to get to work. But uh, we've done some research and we see that uh, less than... 6% uh, of workers uh, walked to work in 1980, and that has declined uh, up to 2006 to 2012, all the way down to less than three uh, workers, uh, or 3% of workers walked to work. So uh, again, there's a fairly significant change. It has uh, dropped by about half uh, the, in terms of the percentage of people who walk to work. Uh, that adds to pollution if people are uh, using even public transportation uh, puts out more pollution than walking. So, but 
public transportation is certainly a, a great option, but if people are driving to work more or if they're Ubering to work more, then that uh, would certainly add to the pollution. So it was never a huge number. You know, we said less than 6%. But when that drops down to less than 3%, uh, that's a, that is, I would say that that's a significant alteration in behavior. So let's talk about social movements and what we mean by social movement. Uh, our textbook defines a social movement as an organized collective activity to bring about or resist fundamental change in an existing group or society. Social movements have had a dramatic impact on the course of history and the evolution of social structure. Uh, so, if we think about some of the social movements that have existed in our lifetime, um, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen uh, the civil rights uh, movement, uh, the black power movement, the red power movement, the uh, women's movement, um, the LGBT uh, community and uh, their movement. Uh, the Occupy Wall Street, uh, I've mentioned uh, Black Lives Matter earlier, so those are all social movements that are, uh, you know, advocating for social change and trying to uh, change our society in a way that is uh, more equitable for the groups involved. Uh, today we see that, uh, you know, social movements are becoming more global in their nature. So the Me Too movement didn't just affect life here in the United States. It was a worldwide movement that had an impact uh, in other countries all around the world, um, some more than others. You know, not all societies were equally uh, affected by the Me Too movement, but uh, uh, I think a lot of communities, a lot of, uh, of countries and societies were influenced by the Me Too movement. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we can look at the uh, environmental movement. That certainly has a global uh, flavor to it because uh, we all are concerned about uh, our environment and how we can try to protect and preserve the environment in such a way that we uh, preserve life, not just human life, but uh, plant life and animal life because, you know, the, uh, the ecosystems uh, that exist around the world are threatened. And so if you lose, uh, you know, maybe you lose a small uh, plankton or something in the ocean, that can have uh, a dramatic impact on the lives of all the the animals that survive on that plankton, um, and that can you know that can lead to dead seas. If uh, you know you start out thinking, well, this this these microscopic or uh, microorganisms uh, are dying off, big deal. Uh, but it can be a big deal if that starts to affect the uh, you know the whole food chain. So. Uh, you know, the environment certainly is, uh, is a global uh, concern. I think, uh, you know, countries all around the world are concerned about overfishing the oceans and uh, the toxins that we put into the air and into the water and things of that nature. Uh, social movements imply the uh, existence of conflict. So, uh, you know, there's always a conflict when we start talking about a social movement because there's there are groups that are opposed to change and then there are groups that are advocating change and uh, they're vying against each other trying to get their message heard and to convince the public that this is something that needs to happen uh, and so even when we think about the industrial revolution uh, the Luddites were opposed to the Industrial Revolution and they did uh, whatever they could to try to derail the uh, Industrial Revolution. They were concerned about uh, people losing you know, their, their way of life as a result of these uh, factories with assembly line production and all of that. Uh, and so they would break into factories and destroy, you know, engage in vandalism and destroy uh, equipment and things of that nature trying to derail the Industrial Revolution. Of course, we know that that was not a successful uh, attempt to uh, alter the social change that occurred, uh, but they certainly uh, ex extended the effort. Uh, we could certainly analyze uh, social movements from a functionalist perspective. They, uh, you know, functionalists might point, that, point out that social movements help to uh, form public opinion and uh, help to develop a consensus when you get people out there sharing their message and influencing people that that can uh, uh, bring us together. Hey, we all need to work together to eliminate uh, nuclear uh, 
reactors because they're dangerous to the environment, they're dangerous to the population, and you have all these uh, spent fuel rods that uh, have to be stored and you have all of this nuclear waste that comes from a nuclear power plant and something has to be done with that and uh, Nevada doesn't really want it uh, in, in its uh, mountain range uh, and so there's this conflict about what to do with these things so uh, you know I, I think uh, it, if, if everybody rises up and say hey we need to get rid of these uh, nuclear power plants there are other options that are safer, there's solar power, wind power, uh, geothermal power. There's a whole lot of different ways that we can, uh, uh, you know, collect energy and gather energy and use it in, in the ways that we need to, to run our uh, air conditioners and, and our refrigerators and all the things that we rely so heavily on. There are other ways of getting the power for that. Uh, than you know polluting the environment with uh, lots of nuclear waste and things of that nature so uh, you know if, if enough people start to uh, get concerned about this then it can result in uh, you know a consensus in the country about hey we need to move away from uh, coal power we need to move away from nuclear power um, and things of that nature so um, we're going to talk a little bit about relative deprivation uh, and the relative deprivation approach. Relative uh, deprivation is the conscious feeling of a negative discrepancy between our expectations, legitimate expectations, and the actualities. So in the United States, we say that all people are created equal and that uh, we strive for equality in our society, and yet we look at the way that police officers interact with African Americans and Hispanic Americans and other uh, disadvantaged groups, and we could say, well, gosh, doesn't look like things are really equal, you know. Um, not everybody has the same opportunity at a good education. If people live in inner city areas uh, or in rural areas, their children may have to go to substandard schools. And when those children graduate from high school and take their ACTs and their SATs and they score very lowly, it's not because the children are not capable of learning. It may be because they have been in an environment that was really not conducive to uh, good educational outcomes and therefore uh, they scored poorly on the exam. And that means that their college options get somewhat limited, right? And so we know that a lot of schools, a lot of universities, uh, particularly the more prestigious universities, only accept the students that score the very highest on those standardized tests. Maybe a child is just not really very good at standardized tests. Uh, Maybe be, be very intelligent and bright and hardworking, but uh, just doesn't do well on standardized tests. So there are a lot of reasons why people might not do well on that exam that besides just their own personal uh, skills and abilities, uh, if, if they're not in a, an educational environment that really stimulates them and provides them a safe environment to study and learn, uh, and if the materials are not there, you know, they can't take their textbooks home at night. They can't, uh, they don't have uh, good research facilities where they can go in and do library research and things of that nature. Uh, that can be problematic. Uh, and if we look at schools in uh, suburban areas where uh, there are higher property values, uh, we might see that those students get some educational opportunities that other kids don't get uh, because the schools are so uh, well-funded compared to inner city schools where property values are much lower uh, and uh, you know the revenue is just not there for a lot of in inner city schools. Uh, so that might be uh, a situation where we say well you know here's our our goal of having you know this level of of equality in our society but we're actually way down here and there's a discrepancy between those two uh, things. We have a legitimate reason to believe that uh, all American citizens should have an opportunity at good education which will lead to greater economic opportunities and when that's denied to large segments of the population that that feeling of relative deprivation can develop 
can develop then uh, because hey it's supposed to be like this but here's way the way it is uh, things need to change uh, and so discontent can then be channeled into a social movement if people feel like they have a right to their goals do you think that all Americans have a right to expect that their children will get a, a decent education in this country I don't think it's a you know a, a, a unexpected I don't think it's an unexpected or an un, un, uh, realistic expectation to assume that your children are going to get a good education when you send them to school in the morning to a, a public elementary school or a public middle school or high school. Okay, uh, And then secondly, the disadvantaged group must realize that their goals can't be achieved without uh, a social movement through conventional means. They need to band together and start exert some, exerting some political pressure on the powers that be. So uh, critics will argue that people don't need to feel deprived to be moved to act, but this is one theory that explains how social movements develop. Uh, we feel like we've got a right to expect that, for example, women might feel that they have a right to go to work without being sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. Uh, I think that's a reasonable expectation. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's it's kind of on the minimal side of a reasonable expectation. I, I think women ought to have a whole lot more safety than that. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's certainly a minimal starting point, in my view, is that they can go to work without being harassed or, or assaulted. And then they look at the number of women who've come forward uh, complaining about, you know, with the, that's what the whole Me Too movement was about, was women uh, airing their, their experiences, sharing their experiences with the rest of society about how men had treated them, mostly men. Now, sometimes it's the other way around, right? Men can be harassed uh, by other men or by women. Uh, but generally speaking, when we talk about sexual harassment in the workplace, it uh, generally refers to uh, women who are being harassed by men. Yes, I'm aware that the other occurs, but uh, you know the, the predominant pattern there is uh, females being harassed by males. So uh, if it's uh, agreed by society that women have a right to go to work without uh, having to feel that they're in a hostile work environment, uh, and, and but that's happening, people, women are being uh, threatened and, and uh, pressured to uh, you know, put up with things that they shouldn't have to put up with, then that may lead to uh, a social movement forming. Uh, and particularly if they've tried to get things done in the traditional way and no change has occurred, they may feel that they have to take to social media, for example. So I think we can understand the Me Too movement uh, very easily by using this relative deprivation approach. But there are some other explanations uh, for how social movements develop and whether they're successful or not, such as the resource mobilization approach. Uh, according to the resource uh, mobilization approach, the ways in which a social movement uh, it focuses on how they use resources. Okay, so for example, wh what are we talking about when we talk about the resources of a social movement? Well, we're talking about volunteers who are willing to do the work, go door to door, knock on doors, distribute uh, distribute pamphlets, and uh, talk about the issues, and try to educate people, engage in public service announcements, and all those kinds of things. Uh, leadership is a major resource to a social movement if you've got a charismatic leader who can encourage people to join the movement and to donate funds to the movement and to help um, that's a huge thing uh, and so when we think about resources we're talking about uh, human volunteers and manpower human power I shouldn't say manpower human power we're talking about money we're talking about media access we're talking about leadership uh, all of those things are resources that social movements can use to try to get their message out to the population okay uh, but you know Karl Marx talked about a concept called false consciousness and he said that false consciousness is a tendency of people to assume that their their lives are better than they are or to see themselves in a way different from their actual reality uh, and he said that uh, these are attitudes that do not reflect the workers actual positions and you have to overcome false consciousness in order to get a social movement off the ground you've got to convince people that hey this is not right 
and it's not acceptable and you shouldn't have to put up with it anymore. And only when we can convince people that their conditions are uh, bad enough that they need to do something about it, uh, can we see a social movement uh, gain steam and get support? And so, you know, with the Me Too, Me Too movement, uh, women had to convince not just uh, other women, but they had to convince men that this was a serious problem and that it needed to be addressed. And I think they very successfully did that. Uh, you know, uh, the casting couch in Hollywood has been around for uh, as long as Hollywood's been around. Uh, and by that, I mean that uh, producers and directors and actors uh, have used their positions uh, to get young women to, uh, to engage in sexual activities with them uh, by using the promise of, hey, there's a part in this movie for you, or if you want to, you know, form a career in acting, then you're going to need some help and I'm willing to help you, but you're going to have to help me. Those kinds of, of relationships developed as soon as uh, the first movies started being shown, the old, uh, uh, you know, silent movies were made. Uh, I'm sure that the casting couch showed up very quickly. And I can just give you an example. Uh, Tippi Hedren, who was in the movie uh, Bur The Birds, uh, an Alfred Hitchcock movie that was made back in the, I guess that was the early 60s. Uh, she claimed that uh, Alfred Hitchcock told her that if she did not sleep with him, that he would ruin her career. And if you look at her career, it was uh, significantly impacted negatively uh, by some actions that Alfred Hitchcock carried out. Now, Hitchcock was considered to be a genius. Uh, he was considered to be, you know, uh, one of the greatest uh, filmmakers of his time. Uh, but uh, here he was engaging in some pretty uh, inappropriate behaviors. So it's been going on for a long time. Why did the Me Too movement take off just in the last couple of years? Well, uh, you know, the use of social media to get that message out and to make people aware of just how widespread the problem was and how many different actresses had to tolerate that kind of stuff and some actors. I mean, Terry Crews um, came forward and said that he was uh, sexually harassed by uh, another male uh, who was in the industry. Uh, if you guys know Terry Crews, he's that uh, very muscular uh, former athlete uh, who uh, does some acting, an African-American actor, uh, been in a lot of commercials and in a lot of uh, TV programs and things of that nature. Seems like a really good guy, but he uh, has uh, shared his own story of, of how at a party, a, a Hollywood uh, producer just assumed that he could put his hands on Terry Crews, and Terry talked about how that, that felt. Um, you know, being uh, sexually assaulted in that way. So, uh, you know, I think uh, this false consciousness, this idea that we've got to mobilize people and convince them that this is a serious problem and it impacts their lives. Uh, you know, Marx said that that would be a major hurdle to overcome in trying to get social movements uh, moving forward. Okay. In terms of gender and social movements, uh, with the exception of the Me Too movement and the women's movement, women typically have not uh, had leadership roles in most uh, social movements. They've been very active and they've done a lot of the legwork, uh, but they seldom have risen to the uh, leadership positions within the social movement. As I said, the Me Too movement and the women's movement are exceptions to that, but generally speaking, uh, women have not as, uh, assumed a lot of leadership positions in social movements historically. Uh, female dominated domains tend to be neglected. So uh, generally speaking, you know, the corporate offices, uh, the higher echelons of, of business are dominated by men. And so the concerns of women have often been uh, kind of pushed aside and, and ignored. Uh, scholars now realize that gender can affect the way we view the world and organized efforts to bring about change or to resist change. So uh, I think they're, uh, you know, scholars are now beginning to look at and investigate how women see social issues and how they can be motivated to get involved in a social movement versus how men uh, might be voted, uh, motivated. So it may take different kinds of messages to appeal to women uh, than to appeal to men. 
There are some new social movements that are developing. Uh, we we uh, use this term to refer to social movements that started after the 1960s or in the late 1960s. Uh, uh, European social scientists said, hey, there's something happening with social movements. They're kind of changing a little bit. Uh, and the, he, they said that there were changes in both the composition and the targets of emerging social movements. Uh, many social movements do not have the social class roots typical of labor protests. So if we think about the early social movements in society, uh, we can think about uh, the attempts to form unions and the attempts of laborers to bring uh, the bourgeoisie, the owners of the means of production, to the bargaining table to discuss work conditions and pay and uh, fringe benefits like time off and vacations and things of that nature. Um, if you remember your history books from high school, you probably remember the Haymarket Affair and all of the uh, conflicts were happening when labor unions were trying to form in the 19 uh, teens and the 1920s. Um, you know, labor unions, we all owe labor unions a tremendous amount of thanks and gratitude and respect for the fact that they uh, they went to war with for us uh, they went to war for workers all across this country and even workers who lived in states where there were no unions benefited from the presence of unions in those states where unions did exist and to this day unions uh, have have given us our our vacation time uh, our 40-hour work week our reasonably safe work conditions uh, for most of our jobs uh, if you have a job today uh, there's a very good chance that your pay and the benefits that go along with that job uh, are in some part due to the efforts of labor unions uh, in the night maybe it was in the 1920s or the 1930s but your life has been impacted in a positive way by labor unions and un unfortunately labor unions today are under attack and they're they're losing their power uh, some of the problems are are self-inflicted uh, you know protecting workers who uh, should be fired because they're uh, you know they're not doing an adequate job uh, that can lead to people resenting the the uh, labor union and it can lead to all kinds of problems so uh, you know some of the problems that face labor unions today are of their own making but most of them come from uh, the bourgeoisie who are trying to break the unions because uh, if there are no unions then you can pay workers uh, pretty much what you want to pay them as long as it's a legal wage uh, and so at least we have a a federal minimum wage but a lot of people believe that that federal minimum wage should be higher than it currently is uh, but that's not going to happen if uh, unions are crushed by uh, the, the owners of the means of production okay so talking about new social movements I was talking there about uh, labor movements and things of that nature new social movements uh, are somewhat different in that they're not just trying to change uh, laws, but they're also trying to change the way people see things. So if you see the LGBT uh, movements or if you see the Me Too movements, those are not just trying to bring about change in behaviors. They're also trying to uh, change people's perceptions of uh, the, the groups that are being disadvantaged. And with these new social movements, the government generally is not seen as an ally. Uh, you know, they don't see uh, the government as uh, somebody who's standing beside them, but rather somebody that they have to act upon and bring about change within the government. Uh, members of new social movements show little inclination to accept established authority, even scientific or technical authority. Uh, and new social movement theory offers a broader global perspective on social and political activism. So uh, I do think that new social movements tend to be somewhat different uh, from some of the old labor uh, you know, conflicts that we had uh, 100 years ago. Uh, but... Uh, they do still have some similarities in terms of trying to bring about change. Okay, so those are three uh, approaches to looking at social movements, and I hope that they kind of help you understand how social movements get uh, organized and how they uh, go forward and try to bring about some change. 
Um, today, of course, uh, unions can communicate, or unions, uh, group, people who are involved in social movements can communicate with each other through uh, social media and things of that nature. Uh, we've got computer communications that uh, make it easier for people to get their message out there and to communicate with each other and to try to get people to join the movement. So, uh, you know, these CMCs or communications uh, through network devices uh, that can uh, uh, that can have an impact on the effectiveness of a social movement today. Uh, so face-to-face -face contacts no longer necessary in order to get your message out um, and uh, you know to develop a social movement. People can use uh, social media to uh, get people to activate and join social movements. Uh, global communications technology helps to create enclaves of people who have similar views on if on certain issues. So, uh, let's move forward. Let's talk about social change. There are a couple of different ways that we can look at change. Uh, your text gives us three different approaches to studying social change. There's what we call evolutionary theory. And as you might uh, imagine, evolutionary theory says that, you know, uh, societies go through this evolution and they go from simple to more complex societies. Uh, Durkheim and other functionalists talked about that and how, uh, you know, over time societies become more complex and, uh, and change occurs kind of slowly. Uh, uh, we can talk specifically about the functionalist perspective and how they view social change. Of course, we know that they are resistant to social change uh, to a large degree. They, they feel that that upsets uh, too much change too quickly, creates uh, chaos and disrupts things in society and certainly that's true when we went from an agricultural society to an industrial society large percentages of people move from the family farm to cities in search of economic opportunities that uh, devastated some of those farming communities which uh, you know lost a lot of population uh, and uh, once were very vibrant uh, communities but now uh, if you drive through uh, East Texas and or West Texas and go through some of the farming communities out there, uh, sometimes they almost look like a ghost town. Uh, there's uh, so, so many fewer people there. Uh, you've got abandoned businesses and uh, houses that have fallen into disrepair and just fallen apart because nobody's living in them anymore. The residents move to the city for economic opportunity. So, of course, social change brings about some disruption of the smooth functioning of society. And so functionalists are uh, typically going to oppose a lot of change. Uh, but the conflict perspective, of course, uh, advocates change. Uh, that's, that's the whole you know, function of conflict theory is to try to uh, bring about change that will result in greater equality and greater social justice. Okay, so we'll talk about these three perspectives. Uh, you know, the economy has changed very dramatically, um, and we can talk about the ways in which certain industries have become more dominant and other industries uh, employ fewer people and have become less dominant. Uh, but evolutionary theory says that society is viewed as moving in a definite direction. As I said, you're going from a more simple society to a more complex society. So let's just think about... Uh, what it takes to be a doctor today compared to what it took to be a doctor uh, 120 years ago, say around the, the turn of the, the 20th century. So uh, in the 20th century, if you were a physician, uh, or around the turn of the century, if you were a physician, uh, you treated everything. You treated, you diagnosed and you treated disease, you performed surgeries, uh, you, you pretty much did everything. Uh, today, if you go to the doctor with a complaint, a physical complaint, uh, that doctor will listen to you and they'll say, ah, I'm going to recommend you uh, see this. Uh, let's say that you're, you're experiencing some gastrointestinal problems. I'm going to send you to this GI doctor, the specialist who specializes in uh, gastrointestinal issues because I think something's going on with you. Uh, and so they will give you a, a, a referral to this doctor uh, and you'll go see the GI doctor and the GI doctor may say well gosh you know I've done all these tests and I see what's going on with you uh, you're going to need surgery to correct this problem so I'm going to refer 
refer you to a surgeon who can perform this procedure. And so then you get another referral to another doctor who then performs the surgery on you and then you, you know, you go and recover and all of that. Well, um, medicine has gotten much more complex. The amount of knowledge that we have about how the human body operates. Uh, and so people have specialized. You've got a general practitioner that you go to with your complaints and they determine is there a problem uh, with this patient that, that needs to be addressed? Uh, or is this something that's uh, going to go away on its own? Uh, you know, a lot of uh, ailments that we have will heal over time without intervention. But doctors, uh, our general practitioners are there to assess whether there is indeed a problem that needs further treatment uh, beyond what they can give. Now, sometimes they can give us a medication or, uh, you know, recommend that we get some physical therapy and the problem resolves. But in some cases, it may be a more serious issue. And so they may refer us to a specialist, an oncologist or, uh, you know, a, a gastroenterologist or, uh, you know, any of these doctors with specialties looking at a specific area of the body, a, a particular type of problem. Uh, and then, of course, surgeons are there. They specialize in performing not just surgery, but certain kinds of surgeries. So you've got doctors that are specialists in abdominal surgeries and brain surgeries and uh, things of that nature. So uh, me medicine has become extremely, extremely specialized uh, unless you're going to be a general practitioner. And even then, uh, you know, there's specialized training for a general practitioner so that they know who to refer uh, patients to with, you know, specific ailments and complaints. So Auguste Comte saw societies as moving forward in their thinking. So moving towards more scientific explanations and moving away from supernatural explanations. Durkheim said that society progressed from simple to more complex forms of social organization. And he spent a lot of time studying the division of labor in society. And he pointed out that in hunting and gathering societies, there was not a complex division of labor. Uh, and then even into agricultural societies, it was getting a little more complex, but not radically more complex because now you had farmers uh, and farmers wives, but you also had storekeepers and you had bankers and you had lawyers uh, forming in the cities. You had school teachers and physicians. There was becoming a more complex division of labor. And then you think to today where we're in a post-industrial society and even within certain types of jobs. If you're going to, like I said, if you're going to be a doctor, there are hundreds of different types of, of uh, medical practice out there. You can be an oncologist or a podiatrist or a pediatrician or, you know, uh, the list just goes on and on. Uh, the flexibility of that, that nurses and doctors have in terms of choosing their career paths and their career fields uh, is uh, absolutely astonishing uh, today. So, uh, as society becomes more complex and as our base of knowledge grows, people start to specialize more and uh, therefore we have a more complex division of labor. Uh, so sociobiologists today study the behavior links between humans and other animals because, uh, you know, I think people are realizing, particularly sociobiologists are realizing uh, that certain animal species engage in behaviors that when you look at human beings, we're not that that uh, far away, you know, in some ways. So, for example, if you watch uh, how some of the uh, 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 some bird species uh, preen and, and court uh, their mate, uh, and then you look at how males, uh, when they're getting dressed uh, to go out and to uh, socialize with people and perhaps to uh, meet a young lady, uh, some of the behaviors that we engage in, or if you think about primates and how they deal with certain things uh, that come up in their uh, their little uh, you know family groups, uh, compared to how human beings behave, um, there can be some uh, some behavior links that that uh, between humans and and our uh, our uh, fellow animals on the planet. Okay. Now, the functionalist uh, approach, I said we would talk about them a little bit. They, uh, they advocate what they call the equilibrium. 
model, and they say that as changes occur to one institution, it sends ripples through the whole uh, society, and changes have to occur to reestablish a new equilibrium. So, for example, when we think about women entering the workforce in very large numbers beginning in the 1970s, and I'm not talking about single women, I'm now talking about married women with children in many cases, going into the workforce in large numbers, that uh, resulted in the increase in the number of daycare centers in our communities. Uh, and so there had to be an adjustment. Uh, women were leaving the home and entering the workforce. They weren't there to supervise and take care of the children. And so that meant that daycare centers or something like them had to develop to take up the slack and to perform the functions that moms had been performing. So Talcott Parsons said that there are four processes, processes of social change that are absolutely inevitable. Number one, he called differentiation. And what he was talking about there was just what we've been talking about, the increased complexity of social organization. You can't just pick a, out a name in the phone book uh, to, to go to see uh, as your physician. You have to find out if that physician is a general practitioner or are they a GI doctor or are they, uh, you know, uh, some other kind of specialist. Uh, and so it's gotten much more complex. So number one, check. Yes, we agree that uh, society has gotten much more complex uh, and people are differentiated in the skills that they hone and sharpen in their particular field of of medicine or whatever we're talking about. Uh, he also talked about what he called adaptive upgrading and he said that social institutions become more specialized in their purposes as well. So not only are human beings becoming more specialized but so are organizations. He also talked about inclusion and he said that as, uh, as society becomes more developed uh, groups that have been in, excluded in the past will now start to be included. So when we see uh, the changes in, in uh, laws regarding same-sex marriage, uh, when we see uh, laws changing and protecting people uh, in their jobs, no matter what their sexual identity, in other words, when we see laws being extended to protect uh, gay people in the work environment, that uh, is more inclusive, and that's kind of what uh, what uh, Parsons was talking about there. And then lastly, he said that value generation generalization would occur. And what he meant by value generalization is that, you know, you have to develop new attitudes or new values that tolerate and legitimate a greater range of activities. So if we think back to the discussion that we had on uh, sexual behavior and what's considered to be appropriate sexual behavior, the parentheses around appropriate behavior were pretty small 200 years ago, but today the sexual behaviors that are considered to be acceptable have widened out pretty significantly. Uh, and so today, uh, American citizens are more open to an African-American president, an African-American CEO. Uh, we are developing new attitudes, uh, same-sex marriage. And so uh, Compt, you know, predict, or Parsons rather, predicted uh, some time ago that as societies become more complex, that uh, we would develop new values that would uh, be more tolerant of each other. Uh, and I do think that that's happening. Unfortunately, you know, we've got uh, 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 the previous generation and my generation where we've got some holdovers from, you know, some of the earlier value uh, sets that people had. And uh, they're, they're not wanting to turn loose of those. Uh, but I, I do believe that younger people tend to be more tolerant of each other and of diversity and of, of differences. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's a very good thing. And I think uh, we're moving in the direction, our society is moving in the direction of greater tolerance. If that disturbs you, uh, you know, it's gonna be uncomfortable going forward because I think uh, uh, most Americans uh, believe that all American citizens deserve opportunities and protections by the government that we're all American citizens um, and, you know, no group of citizens is more valuable than other groups of citizens, or at least I hope we're moving in that direction. Okay. And then conflict perspective. 
of course, they're advocating for change. Uh, they believe that social institutions and practices persist because it maintains the status quo, and they believe it's time to shake that stuff up. And uh, Marx said that a class of people are exploited during each stage of history. You know, women have been exploited at various times in history, uh, and then various uh, uh, racial and ethnic categories have been uh, exploited at various times through history, enslaved and things of that nature. Uh, and conflict is considered to be a normal and desirable aspect of social change, according to Marx. Uh, and Derendorf, Ralph Derendorf, um, was one individual who said that, hey, these functionalist and conflict approaches to social change are not uh, uh, incompatible. He said that uh, functionalist and conflict explanations can be compatible with each other. He's one of the few uh, theorists who has made that assertion and what he means by that is yes we have this you know we have this equilibrium but we sometimes we need to upset the equilibrium and we need some conflict in society to bring about change and move in the direction of greater equality okay so why do uh, social movements fail? Well, sometimes there are people who have vested interests. If you are uh, a farmer and uh, you see the movement towards mechanization as a threat to your livelihood and the, your way of life, you know, think about Amish people. They have resisted the technological changes that came with tractors and all the technology that would allow farmers to produce bigger crops with less effort. Uh, they have resisted that because they saw it as a fundamental threat to their way of life. And so, uh, you know, there are uh, groups called the urban Amish who are, again, resisting technology and technological advances because it poses a threat to their lives. Uh, throughout history, uh, people have been frightened by change. Uh, change is scary. The unknown is scary. We don't know what's going to happen when change starts to occur. And so people are fearful about change and that may cause them to resist change and they may fear that it's going to uh, directly impact them. I mean, if you run a business that uh, builds a product or you know focuses on a product that could be uh, become obsolete by the development of new products, uh, your livelihood is threatened, and so you have a vested interest in resisting that change. Companies can resist social change by cutting corners uh, or by pressuring the government to ease regulations. Uh, it can be expensive to meet safety and environmental regulations, and so right now we've got a president who is uh, really listening to business owners uh, and reducing a lot of restrictions on environmental protections. Uh, and I think that that's going to have a negative uh, uh, long-term effect on our society and on the business environment. Uh, yes, it may free up business uh, to, to hire more employees in the short term, but uh, the impact on the environment eventually is going to come back to, uh, to haunt us, I'm afraid. You also have this not in my backyard movement, NIMBY. Uh, they call it the NIMBY uh, effect, not in my backyard. We all agree that, uh, you know, there needs to be more low-income housing and there need to be more mental institutions and uh, more prisons, but nobody wants those things in their backyards. And so you get this uh, not in my backyard kind of reaction to any kind of uh, suggestion of social change. For example, think about if, uh, if a group decided to... Uh, come into your community, into your, maybe even into your neighborhood and establish a group home for people who are recovering from substance abuse, what would your reaction be? Well, not in my backyard, maybe, uh, might be your reaction because even though you understand that, uh, people who have substance abuse problems need treatment, um, uh, the presence of those people in your neighborhood might be frightening. Uh, the possibility that some of those people might relapse and uh, because of their proximity to your neighborhood might break into your home or steal your car or something like that uh, or, or perhaps even, you know, harm somebody, uh, even though, you know, research shows that that's, that's probably not going to happen, uh, then, you know, people get fearful about that and they say, well, not in my backyard. I don't want this 
prison. Yes, we need more prisons, but I don't want it in my community. I want it built somewhere else. Uh, and so your text points out that uh, not on my planet uh, can become a, a reaction that people might have. Uh, there can also be a culture lag, you know, uh, the period of that's a period of maladjustment when technology changes faster than our rules for using the technology. Uh, so we're struggling to use a new material uh, component of culture and we don't yet have the non-material aspects of the culture uh, in place. So. They, you know, we can think about things like drone use. Uh, we don't have enough laws on the books right now to regulate drone use. Uh, if a drone is flying over your property, do you have a right to shoot it down? Well, of course not. But uh, at some point, if those people are doing things, you know, using their drone, their drones to videotape things, and you have a, a right to privacy uh, on your property. Uh, see, that becomes a very sticky uh, issue, doesn't it? Uh, so our changes in our material culture can strain our values and our beliefs. And that can result in some culture lag. So again, people can be somewhat resistant to that. And then, of course, uh, there are resistances to technology. I talked about the Luddites and the urban Amish and other groups like that. Uh, you know, sometimes technological changes do uh, bring about some frightening things and uh, we don't really know how to deal with technology sometimes for example uh, you know I think uh, the technology is probably there to clone human beings uh, but uh, there's no researcher in the world who is going to uh, to do that openly uh, because there are lots of international there are, there are federal laws and international laws against cloning human beings uh, and so, at least for the present, uh, we haven't had, I think there was one Chinese researcher who came out and claimed to have uh, cloned some human beings, uh, but he was, uh, uh, he disappeared uh, very quickly and he was uh, accused of, of faking his, uh, his uh, results and, uh, you know, he was certainly accused of being a, an unethical researcher if indeed he was doing research into that, uh, that process. So, uh, you know, I think right now at least uh, most societies in the world have agreed that cloning of human beings is kind of off limits, but uh, there will come a time when somebody challenges that. Uh, I think that's inevitable that at some point uh, a, a human researcher will uh, delve into cloning human beings. And the first few that do it will certainly face uh, criticism and perhaps even prosecution uh, because um, that that's a pretty dangerous thing when you start uh, you know trying to clone human beings and things of that and it opens up a whole lot of ethical considerations that have to be uh, to have to be dealt with that we have to develop laws around all of that so uh, in terms of global social change, uh, there are a number of uh, examples of that. The collapse of communism, the spread of AIDS, cloning, uh, the generation of human embryonic stem cells. All of those are examples of social change that have affected uh, not just our country, but the entire uh, globe. So uh, can change be anticipated? We know that the fall of the Soviet Union was really, uh, there were only one or two researchers who said, hey, I think something's going on with Russia, the Soviet Union, and we may see uh, some splitting there. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the Soviet Union was expanding and expanding its, its territory and expanding its military might, and that resulted in its collapse. Uh, but unfortunately, there weren't very many sociologists that predicted that, that was going to occur. So uh, the focus of doing research uh, is to understand society and to predict change and to predict that, hey, if this happens, then that's going to happen. And unfortunately, our models in the past have not been particularly good. And you will hear about, uh, you know, even models today, like the models that predict the number of uh, cases and deaths of uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, you will hear people criticize those models. Well, models are not really intended to be 100% accurate. I mean, obviously we want our models to be as accurate as possible, but you can't really control all of the external occurrences that happen in a particular situation. And so uh, if people start wearing masks before they're told to by the government, that can have an impact on the number of cases. If people resist wearing masks in spite of the fact that 
the CDC is telling them to wear masks, that can cause an increase in the number of cases uh, because, you know, people are not doing what they've been told to do. Um, and so it's hard to predict. It's hard to develop good models that explain and predict human behavior. We're getting better, but we still have a ways to go. So when you hear that a model was not particularly effective in predicting, uh, you need to look not just at the model, was the model flawed, but you also need to look at what happened in that situation that could have influenced some of the variables that uh, affected the uh, predictability of the human behavior. So uh, is there another explanation for why the model wasn't successful other than that the model is flawed? Uh, perhaps uh, some things happened, there were some historical events that changed the outcome that the model wasn't built to take into consideration. You know, like I said, human resistance, uh, people listening to a president who says, ah, this thing's going to disappear. We're at 15 cases. It's going to go to zero cases pretty quickly. That kind of stuff can influence whether a model is uh, successful at predicting behavior or not. When you've got a large group of people who, you know, listen to a leader and follow his lead, even though uh, he's contradicting what some other uh, experts are saying, scientists, uh, who study these things are saying, hey, this is what we need to be doing. Uh, that can be uh, that can be problematic to trying to model, uh, you know, the outcomes of behaviors. So uh, I think that's probably a pretty good way uh, to end the chapter. Uh, uh, we've got about an hour in and uh, I think I've covered most of the uh, more important uh, aspects of the chapter. But uh, please do read the chapter thoroughly and uh, be ready for the exam. Uh, and uh, be on the lookout for kind of a wrap-up uh, video, uh, you know, in the next day or so. Uh, talk to you soon, guys. Study hard.